In 2015, GCFI and NOAA announced the Ocean Innovation Award, a new program to help bring solutions to the issues facing our oceans. The first Ocean Innovation Award focused on encouraging new responses to coral bleaching in the Caribbean region. Rather than the usual proposal process, the applicants faced a GCFI Shark Tank interview with top coral scientists from NOAA, from Australia and the Caribbean. The winning proposal was made by the Keys Ocean Rangers, a group of high school students who were represented at the 69th GCFI meeting in Grand Cayman by Jack Kramer, who now holds the distinction of being GCFI's youngest ever presenter. His presentation is entitled Turning Down the Heat, an innovative citizen science pilot project to reduce the impacts of coral bleaching. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jack Kramer, and I'm part of a young science team called the Keys Ocean Rangers. Uh, we're super excited to receive GCFI's Ocean Innovation Award, and I'll be talking today about our project called, uh, it's a feasibility study on innovative ways to reduce the impacts of coral bleaching. The purpose of our study was to design, test, and compare several innovative technologies to reduce water temperatures, reduce solar irradiance reaching corals, and increase mixing and oxygenation of the water column. Today I'll present the design of each system, review its ability to influence factors of temperature, light, and water circulation, as well as the results of the feasibility study. Thermal-related bleaching poses one of the most serious threats to tropical coral reefs around the world. Here in the Caribbean, coral reefs suffered major losses due to high ocean temperatures in 1998, 2005, and 2010. Sea surface temperatures are predicted to increase to levels that are beyond the thermal tolerance of corals. As a result, future coral bleaching events and associated mortality will increase. This poses a serious concern for managers, especially on high-risk or high-value reefs, such as nurseries and dive sites, and because there are few ways to reduce acute heat stress during bleaching events. The broader concept of our project includes a three-part approach. First, we hope to design a response system to reduce localized sea surface temperatures at high-risk areas. Second is to develop criteria to identify the best response system to use on reefs at greatest risk to thermal stress. The third stage is to collaborate with managers and volunteers to respond quickly and effectively. There are many factors that cause core bleaching, but for this project we are focusing on excess temperature, increased light or solar radiation, and decreased mixing or lack of flow. Corals live within a relatively narrow temperature margin, and unusually high temperatures can induce coral bleaching. When water is too warm, corals will expel their symbiotic algae living in their tissues, causing the coral to turn white or bleached. During hot summer months, elevated temperature and irradiance often occur at the same time, especially in shallow water reefs. Corals can also be negatively affected by both photosynthetically active radiation and ultraviolet radiation. Water flow rates also influence the degree to which corals can withstand high, te high temperatures and irradiance. Reefs in low circulation or stagnant water may be exposed to higher water temperatures and poor water quality. While those are the negative factors affecting corals, we wanted to know, are there ways to reduce stress during bleaching events by actively reducing temperature, decreasing solar radiation, or increasing circulation? Some interesting research came from early studies by Nakamura, Van Wosik, and all. Through several lab experiments, they looked at how water circulation and flow affect photoinhibition, or the ability of corals' algal symbionts to photosynthesize during elevated heat stress. They found flow right at the interface of the corals promotes passive diffusion across the boundary between the coral tissue and the environment, thereby reducing photoinhibition. So increasing flow right above the coral, not the entire water column, may help reduce stress during bleaching events. Dr. Van Wosik was able to join us in the field to see our experiments and help provide guidance. Dr. Alan Muller, who I had a chance to do a field class with this summer, did a follow-up study on the above work and look at how light intensity influences the progression of coral disease. In 2008, in the British Virgin Islands, she did a study with 18 Copophilia natans colonies that had active white band disease. 
For nine of these colonies, they used a shade device made of a PVC frame and smoked colored plastic. They set the frames about 10 centimeters above the coral's surface to avoid stress through the disruption of water flow. Their results showed that white plague disease on shaded corals progressed much more slowly than on coral colonies without shade. Shade may have either alleviated stress on the coral's symbiotic algae or disease pathogen activity was lower in low light conditions. Based on these lab and small scale studies, we wanted to know, could you scale up efforts to increase flow and decrease temperature and solar stress? The goal for our project was to design, scale up, and test techniques to reduce stress to corals. We designed several different systems. The first system we designed was based on the concept of evaporative cooling, which is when a liquid evaporates, the surface of the liquid remains cool. To increase evaporative cooling in the water, we designed and built a sprinkler mister system that works by bringing seawater up through a tube and showering it above the water surface. We wanted to see if our sprinkler misting system could cool surface temperatures by both evaporative cooling and by creating disturbance at the water surface to increase solar reflection. Our second parameter to examine was aeration and mixing. We built two systems, an airlift pump and a bubble curtain, and also tested a commercially built aeration system. We wanted to measure if our systems could reduce water temperature and increase flow by mixing the warmer and cooler layers. Our third parameter to examine was shading. We originally designed a system to collect and use sargassum as a natural shading material. Last summer, sargassum was overly abundant, but since it was less abundant this past summer, we decided to use pre-made shade cloths. For the shade cloths, we wanted to measure if our system would cool surface temperatures as well as reduce UV radiation and decrease light penetration. For each of these systems we examined, how does the system work at different scales? Was the system able to influence temperature, light, or mixing? And was the system low cost and easy to scale up? We conducted our experiments at two scales. The first was a small pool, 24 feet in diameter, with a volume of about 14,000 gallons. Uh, if you look at the car and our team, you can get an idea of the scale. For the pool tests, we used four cooling systems, an airlift pump, a bubbler, a sprinkler, and shade. These tests ran for five hours during peak daylight from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. Controls were run for each of the different systems. After a month of pool experiments, we scaled up to the project to a very large saltwater quarry on Grassy Key in the Florida Keys. It's tidally influenced by the surrounding seas and has abundant fish and other marine life. Uh, it's about the size of four football fields, and if you take a closer look to the far left of the photo, you can see the cars for scale. The owners helped sponsor our project by letting us adopt and use the back left portion of the quarry, which you can see in the photo. We spent two months in July and August running the field experiments in the quarry. The parameters we measured were water temperature, UV light, and flow. We set up a test area for each scale. For the pool, it was the 24 diameter pool. The quarry is about 45 feet deep, and because of that, we wanted to run our experiments at about 20 feet. So we built a floating PVC frame to support the experiment. The PVC frame was 10 by 10 meters wide and connected to a floating boom at the four corners by polypropylene line. Hobo temperature loggers were used in this study to collect water temperature data every minute. A total of 12 loggers were used at two different depths. To avoid the influence of solar radiation on the logger itself, each logger was carefully wrapped in reflective aluminum tape. Loggers were placed in a grid around the area at two depths. Cooling was evaluated by comparing the average degree of solar heating over a five-hour period between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. Next, we set out hobo light loggers to measure photosynthetically active radiation in the range of 350 to 700 nanometers. We attached uh, the bubble hose and the aerator to the PVC frame and attached them to an above water air source. Uh, we also set up a control site outside the test area and all of our work was done by snorkeling or free diving. To help support the PVC frame in the water column, we set out a boom. It was 18 inches in diameter with six inches above the water and 12 below. Uh, it was graciously donated to us for use in the quarry test. In the last photo, you can see the white floating boom designating the 30 by 30 foot test area. 
For the pool test, we were able to easily conduct experiments from land with electricity, but for the quarry, we needed to be self-sufficient. We used a floating platform to support the generator and air supply system for the bubbler and aerator. The CANDAC platform consists of 24 heavy-duty modular blocks to form a nine foot by six foot square. We received a discount on the blocks from the manufacturer who was very excited to help support our project. The platform is designed to support over 3,000 pounds and was attached to the boom by a system of shackles, eye bolts, and polypropylene line. For the open ocean, it is fitted with a heavy duty anchoring system around its perimeter so that it can be safely secured to the seabed under normal open water conditions. For the pool tests, we used a small pump for the quarry, we scaled this up to a design, a generator-operated power system. The Honda generator was converted to run on propane instead of gasoline to be more efficient and can run 12 hours on a single tank. The air pump was donated to us from a company called Vertex. It's 25 PSI with a flow rate of 26,000 gallons per minute, and it has four outputs, which means it can power all four of our diffusers at the same time. The first cooling system we designed was the bubble screen. Commercial bubble screens are used at the mouth of many canals in the Florida Keys to keep out sargassum and other floating seaweeds. To keep costs low, we used a simple drip hose used for irrigation. You can usually get one at a hardware store for around $10. We attached two hoses at about seven meters depth around the PVC array. It was connected to the surface supply system. It creates a linear stream of millions of tiny bubbles and uh, you can get an idea here of the video of the kind of effect that it has on the water. Uh, after we completed our work, we found that there are industrial grade bubble hoses that have been used for other applications. The bottom right photo shows an example of a very large scale bubble screen used around an offshore oil rig operations to reduce noise. So while we scaled up to a 10 meter reef area, the technology has scaled up to much larger areas. We were very fortunate to have a commercial grade aeration system donated to our core project by Vertex Water Features. In addition to the air supply system described earlier, they also gave us four aerator disks and 300 feet of connecting tubing. The aerator disks are nine inches in diameter with a membrane over the top, producing a steady flow of 0.5 millimeters to three millimeters size bubbles. You can configure the aerators in different patterns. We chose to place them on the four corners of our frame, the inner square of the PVC frame. While the bubble hose produces a linear supply of bubbles, the aerators form a more dense column of bubbles. The four aerators were able to influence a more of a cylinder of water, mixing bottom and top layers of water, as well as adding oxygen to the water. We ran the aerator test by itself and in combination with the shade and with the bubbler. While Dr. Muller used a plastic sheet over her PVC frame, we used a shade material available from any kind of hardware store. The shade cloth was rated to reduce about 70% of UV penetration. It comes in a roll of six foot wide and a by 100 feet. We had an amazing team that sewed together uh, and, and changed the shade cloth to uh, 24 by 24 feet for the pool and then 30 by 30 feet for the quarry. Uh, we also, in the quarry test, added a sleeve that had a, a PVC frame around it to help for extra stability and flotation. The shade cloth fits nicely inside the boom uh, and is held to, in the boom by bungee cords and twine. Uh, the shade cloth was also easy to pull into the test site. Uh, and we had a whole team to do it, but it is possible to do it with as few as two people. And at the end of the day, the shade cloth is easy to wrap up and put away. Now with a better understanding of the experiments, we can revisit the questions we initially asked. How does the system work at larger scales? The systems that worked best were the bubble screen, the aerator, and the shade. They were designs that we decided to take from the pool scale to the quarry. Our designs for the air pump and sprinkler systems were not as effective and would need a redesign if we were to scale up. 
Was the system able to influence temperature, light, or mixing? In the quarry, the best combination was the shade and the bubble screen. In the pool, the most effective for reducing temperature was the shade. The shade reduced the most light, and the bubble screen had the largest effect on mixing. The bubble screen, they were all easy and low cost to scale up. The bubble screen was about $20 plus the donation uh, of the air pump. The vertex was all a donation, but would cost about $3,000 US dollars normally. The shade cost about $250 for the cloth, the PVC, and the PVC glue. To date, we've designed prototypes for our cooling systems. We've conducted experiments to measure temperature, UV flow, and the volume of water that can be affected. We've scaled up our experiments from the pool to a quarry, and we've evaluated efficiency, feasibility, and cost benefit. And we've also involved over 20 young scientists and community members, and we have over 17,000 volunteer hours. Our next steps include scaling our, up the field experiments to the open ocean next summer before sea surface temperatures increase to run trials again if bleaching occurs. We will be working with FWC at their Marathon Nursery to build new nursery platforms and coral trees. We will test the bubble screen, aerator, and shade systems. In addition to measuring physical parameters, we will also record coral condition, such as tissue discoloration, disease, or mortality. Uh, I want to take this time to thank uh, GCFI and specifically the Ocean Innovation Award Committee, uh, FWC and NOAA for all their great input and support on this project. And also want to thank all our volunteers and our support team of scientists and supervisors. Thank you. Any questions? I'm going to take the, um, the uh, moderator's uh, um, position of allowing a few questions for Jack, uh, even though time has run short. Does anybody have any questions? Oh, Christy? Here. That was really great. What was your most unexpected um, experience in the field, or hiccup, I guess. He, field work is hard. <laughs> so yeah, what was the, was the most unexpected challenge that you guys it encountered? It was challenging and a lot of fun. Um, one of the biggest challenges was when we started to, uh, to remove the experiment from the quarry uh, after spending about two months in the water. Uh, it had become biofouled, and there were lots of barnacles and tunicates uh, covering the, the boom and the the floating platform and the PVC array underwater. So it was a big challenge to get all that out and clean it all up. But it's been a lot of fun working, and uh, it's, it's great that we get the opportunity to do this. I bet he would have something to say about permitting, too. <laughs> <laughs> yep, permitting has been a little bit of a challenge, but all the agencies that we've talked with have been really supportive and uh, a really great resource to work with. Um, does anybody have any more questions? Oh, Bryce, we're getting a husband-wife tag team. Are, are you scouting him for a student? Well, GCFI is, uh, is the, uh, the agent. Yeah. I was just wondering whether or not, especially in the quarry, obviously you said that there were, there were fish in there, right? So, so you have this, this twofold thing going on where you, you're, you're impacting temperature and radiance, but I was wondering if you saw uh, any aggregation of fishes under it, so, so an attracting device or yeah, habitat. that was one of one of the most interesting things is um, when the the bubble systems or the aeration systems uh, were turned on, and there were all those bubbles floating up. Uh, not big fish, but there were a lot of uh, small minnow-sized fish that would aggregate and cloud around the streams of bubbles. It's a really good uh, presentation and great ideas. There, there have been some discussions about using shade cloth uh, to, pre to try to prevent some, some bleaching and that sort of thing. And there's a lot of concern about wave energy once you start to add some, some waves and turbulence and how you maintain control of the shade cloth. Is that something that 
your young brains might uh, come up with a better that's, idea than many of us have uh, that's been That's something able to think we've of. been talking a lot with the permitting agencies about. Um, that is one of their concerns. And so we've been working on ways to develop different technologies. Um, one of the things we had come up with was um, putting the shade cloth under the water um, and using uh, larger heavy duty anchors um, to keep it uh, in place. Thanks a lot, Jack. Thank you. That was, that was great. Thanks for watching. We look forward to seeing you at the 70th Annual GCFI Meeting in Merida, Mexico, on November 6 to 10, 2017.